Good morning. I'm Jack Bissing. Uh, John is my correct name, but no one ever called me that. So that's how we know who strangers are coming by. They asked for John instead of Jack. And uh, I am the son of Richard and Edna Bissing, and I'm a lifelong resident of Jeffersonville, Indiana. And I, I have been a school teacher. I have worked in the boatyards, and I am now an attorney. And I have been an attorney since 1976. Even though I'm 65 years old, uh, it doesn't seem right. I feel like I'm talking about my dad when I talk about being 65. You know, I was lucky to be raised by a secure, well-established uh, man who had no identity problems. My dad, Richard Bissing, although he served as mayor for 20 years, which is the longest consecutive period of service anybody's ever had in the city of Jeffersonville, and was offered the lieutenant governorship to run during part of that time, began as a uh, mechanic in a family garage here in Jeffersonville. Part of the time, dad's family had a too many people eating out of the same uh, basket, so we moved to uh, the Jefferson Villa Motel he built. And that was a place, our home was there. Our family room was the office, and uh, we had a friendly drop-in sort of a, a relationship with anybody who came by. One of the people who came by on a frequent basis was Reverend Branham. Now, he was, we never knew him as Reverend Brandon. We always called him Billy. And he and Dad were the best of buddies. I think he was a few years older than my dad, but not many, and they were pals. I recall sitting on the floor in front of the TV set with these two fellows behind me, drinking a cup of coffee or a Coke, telling stories about how things were. They were friends all through, uh, all through life. One day my dad told me, he said, you know, Billy Branham fed people. He said a lot of people would have starved to death in the Depression, but Billy carried a, a 22 with him when he was out walking the lines and shot squirrels and rabbits and brought them back and fed folks. He said, never thought twice about it. <laughs> now, one of the issues you guys brought up to me was the uh, George Rogers Clark Bridge and uh, the fact that people fell and were involved in the, uh, they're still there, they're inside the pillar. Now that wasn't really widely reported. That was, that was opened in 1929. My dad was 14 years old then and had taken a car out of the garage and sat at the line where the ribbon was all night long to be the first one to drive over with his cousin. And they, He's got a little silver or a bronze medallion they were giving away to people on the bridge that day. So that would put that a year and a half, two years earlier when they were building that pillar. My grandmother, Maud, and uh, another lady, Dorothy Phillips, uh, also a St. Luke's member, were, were younger people. Dorothy was about my dad's age and was standing on the bank and told me the story that she watched the scaffolding collapse. And there were people who fell inside the pier, as workmen. Now, the cement just kept coming on top of them. And uh, they couldn't stop the poor because it would have to ruin, tear the whole pillar down. So those guys are there today. Inside the pillar. Inside the pillar. I guess it was never really widely reported in the news media. But uh, my grandmother assured me that that was true. And I know that Dorothy, who's long since deceased, uh, said she was there and saw it. Now, those are things uh, that nobody really had the instant reporting that we do today, where you're, you're bombarded ad nauseum by interviews and reporters. <laughs> But I believe that there's absolutely no question in my mind that that, that occurred. Your grandmother. Yes. Uh, and uh, this, this 
Phillips. Miss Phillips. Mm -hmm. um, they witnessed. I know Miss Phillips witnessed it because she went on at length with me, explaining about how she had seen the scaffolding and seen these people up here, and there was some kind of a contraption where they were pouring uh, a lot of cement inside that pillar. And she said, all of a sudden, the scaffolding just came apart, and men just fell into the pour, and uh, they kept pouring. Didn't know how many. No, she didn't. She did not recall the count, uh, but uh, it was it was a number of men, and you know I don't know, uh, I don't know if anybody there would be any way to recall how many actually went in but it was more than one or two or three. It was, you know, she was a kid and she was panicked at the, on the side of the river watching that. So, you know, uh, could have been a dozen, could have been more. But it was a significant number of people that all of a sudden lost their footing, scaffolding did collapse, and concrete kept coming. And a lot of people knew about it. Oh yeah, at that time. Now nobody wanted to stop the bridge. <laughs> Want to get that, that bridge needed to get done, and I guess the people at at Will looked around and said, "Well, you know, we really if we had to tear that pillar down and start over again, oh, how what kind of delay would that be?" And this is just a risk those fellows assumed by taking that kind of work. It's significant to note that after that bridge was completed. It was a toll bridge, and uh, World War II came, and the Indiana Army Ammunition Plant came, and they paid it off in relatively short order because of the people working at the plant were going using that bridge. And there really wasn't another new bridge that was built until about the early 1960s. And so it was, uh, no, it was, a, it was a last of a big construction boom. Social Security, there was no health insurance. There was no concern for the welfare of the small uh, worker. Workers were, you know, at mercy. This is the time when labor unions were being started because of the horrible conditions of the working person. So, no, there wouldn't have been any thought. Wouldn't have been anybody to care. Wouldn't have been a union steward to come by and uh, report that. You know, people were just there. Some of them were out of town, I'm sure. Some of them were local. And uh, the construction company that built the bridge would not have been a local company. It would have been a specialty contractor. And these were people who would probably work regularly for those people. Did they hear anything about Brother Brown giving this prophecy, or would they have been in the loop there as far as attending his church? Or well, they wouldn't have. They've never attended uh, any of Billy's churches. Uh, they were always uh, at St. Luke's out here, so we've never been a part of the congregation there with Brother Branham. Although, you know, uh, on special occasions we have attended, you know, functions that, that he had. But uh, I don't recall anybody ever, any of them telling me directly. Now I know that my dad said that B Brother Billy had gift of sight and a gift of, uh, you know, clair he was clairvoyant in a lot of things. And I know that at the motel, remember that was in the 50s when we lived there, uh, a lot of Brother Branham's parishioners or friends or people who came to him for healing stayed with us. And they would rent a room. And I recall my dad on a Sunday afternoon taking me aside and says, see that guy there? He said, yeah, he came in on crutches in a wheelchair and he's walking out of here today. He said, Brother Branham healed him. And that was the Jefferson Villa Motel? Jefferson Villa Motel. We, that, Dad built that up a little bit at a time and uh, started out at 12 little units and then he built another section which put our house in it so we actually were a part of that. We lived there, and uh, the office of the motel was really our family room. 
So when people came in to register, they sort of walked by the TV and we had a counter back there for them. And then our kitchen, the house was next door, so mother frequently served uh, coffee and meals to people there. And it was hard to say what was work and what was uh, social. Brother Billy was there frequently and you know, he'd have a cup of coffee with dad and sometimes it would be up at the table or sometimes through the door out in the, in the family room office. Frequent visitor and uh, his people were always happy and they were always glad to be there and gracious. And uh, you know, we had uh, a good relationship with him. There was good stories. One day he walked in with a, a uh, parcel of butcher paper and uh, so what, it looks, he said, Edna, come here, I brought you something. And it was bear steaks. <laughs> he had shot a bear and he had it cut into steaks. He said, I bet you've never had bear steaks. And she said, well, yeah, you're right, I've never had bear steaks. And uh, it was a challenge for her to figure out how to cook them. But it was, a, it was an event. The whole family got to participate and extended family as well. So that only time I ever had bear was from him. Uh, you know, I never really understood how significant he was because he and my dad were just guys in the shirt sleeves, uh, just, just buddies. It wasn't somebody, we're doing something here for a purpose to enhance my picture and enhance my credibility in a, in a community. These are guys who just lived. You know, my father uh, ran the wreckers for the garage even after he had the motel. And he would go out and retrieve cars at night. And if there's a wreck or somebody broken down or a criminal act and they had to haul away a vehicle, my dad would get the call. And uh, it was, I got to go with him a lot of times as a little guy. Uh, and it was fun. Uh, one year he broke his back and he was laid up and I recall Brother Billy coming by to see him while he was in a this contraption that went all the way around down from his hips to his shoulders and it was laced up and uh, I think Armand Fisher and put that together for him back in 1957. In 1958 I had rheumatic fever and I woke up one morning, I'd had an inner ear infection. They did not have tubes for kids' ears at that time. And I was, my hands were locked about like this and my back was twisted and uh, I couldn't move. And uh, so mother of course was in a panic and that the whole day was spent taking me straight to the doctor and then straight into St. Edward's Hospital in New Albany where I spent the next three weeks with rheumatic fever. They found out that I had a heart murmur. And uh, they were terrified. They were pretty much concerned that this could be a, a fatal experience for a 10 year old. And uh, I recall Brother Billy uh, coming by and seeing me when I got home and said, you don't worry, you'll be all right. Well, uh, I still have the heart murmur, but here I am, I'm 65 years old. It did not kill me. And uh, it gave my parents great comfort. And, uh, you know, I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I, I keep going. Um, you know, I, I could sit around with telling Brother Billy stories all day long. He's kind of a man's man, you know. He didn't worry about, uh, how people viewed him. He just was who he was, much like my father. I mean, they did not have a, a public image and a personal image. They were the same 24 seven. And, uh, you know, it's like dad said, you know, I always thought a lot of him because he fed people who were hungry. He never said anything about it. He never told anybody about it. He just did it. And that's how men do. There are a lot of people who are male, but really aren't what I'd call a man. 
So I was lucky. I was raised by a bunch of guys who really had no self-esteem questions. They knew who they were. Brother Billy is one of those kind of guys. I'm lucky to be around him.